So, I'm going to speak very quickly, I apologize. Um, my name is Chad Fowler, I work on something called Wonderlist. Any Wonderlist users by chance? Very cool. So, uh, I'm working right now on Wonderlist 3, which will be released, uh, uh, I think, last March. Um, yes, that's a joke. It's not done yet, but it's almost done. I have it on my phone. I'll show it to you if you want to see it. It's really good. We're building a whole new infrastructure. We're doing kind of a big rewrite. Uh, when I went to work at Wonderlist, some of my friends asked me, why are you going to work on a to-do list? Isn't that just like the hello world of applications at this point? And it is. If you Google for build a to-do list application or any sort of uh, variation of that phrase, you're going to find so many different examples of how to do it. Um, it is kind of the thing that everybody understands the best, right? Very easy. You start out and you think, well, this is just like, there's a list and there are tasks in it and that's it. You can check them off. You can put them in an order probably. Simple, right? Uh, yes, it's very simple if you stop there. The reason that building a to-do list is hard and the reason that it's worth listening to me talk about it, I hope, um, are three major things. Sync, meaning you have to actually synchronize changes between probably a server and definitely some device or multiple devices. Scale. We have millions of users that are active daily and monthly. Um, so when you just have a to-do list, it's one thing on your computer. When you have to have one that synchronizes and works for millions of active users, then it's a completely different matter. And then finally, a requirement that we have that we're putting into Wonderlist 3 is that changes appear in real time across all devices for shared lists. So in the case of Wonderlist, we have the need to synchronize at high scale, real time, with multiple clients and multiple users, potentially each with multiple clients. Those users also share with each other. So we have little universes of data that we have to deal with. What we have effectively built, as I say in the title of this talk, is a high volume, multi-master, cross-platform, distributed database system that runs on mobile devices, web browsers, and client desktop ap operating systems natively. Uh, that sounds kind of buzzwordy, obviously, and it's meant to, but it also represents the reality of the system. It really is a multi-master replicating database system that has to work on an iPhone, Android, iPad, web browser, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a really hard problem, even though the end result is just a to-do list, as people like to say. So, sync. First, let's just talk about what Wonderless is. So you can see this is, this is a screenshot of Wonderless 3 on my computer. It's lists, it's tasks. Lists have positions, tasks have positions, tasks have attributes. You can complete them, you can assign them to people, you can star them, you can write notes about them, they can have subtasks, et cetera. You can even comment and do files. So we have a bunch of different entities in the system. Every time we add now a new feature, we create new entities that also need to synchronize. So you can think of this as a tree, and I'll show you that tree in, the, in, in uh, a future slide here. You can think of it as a tree of data where you have a user who has list that has tasks that has stuff in the tasks, right? So if you were going to build a sync system for one user who only has one device, uh, I mean, it could be many users, but each user would just log in and have their own little universe, kind of like the way Apple's iCloud stuff works. It's pretty easy to implement. They have to do it at massive scale, but you could just imagine doing like the simplest, most idiotic thing that could possibly work. That's what Wonderlist 1 was, in fact. You have an application, you have a REST API, and you have a database. That's it. You put stuff into the REST API, you get all the stuff back out when it changes. So there's no need to really even worry about synchronization. It's very easy. That's why building a to-do list is such a simple thing. I create all my tasks, I push them to the server. Whenever I log back in, I get all the tasks and lists from the server, and I'm set kind of works until you start sharing. So even when you're sharing with one user having multiple devices, it turns into a pain. For one, probably the data gets a little harder to deal with. Uh, second, you may end up having uh, changes that conflict between the two devices. So that's when it starts getting a little bit more difficult. So the first thing, like you have too much data, how do you deal with just getting the parts that have changed? Well, the naive, typical approach that you would go for first is probably some kind of timestamp, right? 
Now, you would not use a client timestamp because we're all too smart for that. You would never trust the timestamp on the client because you know your phone or your computer can have a different time than a server, obviously. Things are not in sync. The problem is servers are also not in sync, so you just can't use a timestamp at all. Uh, times are not trustworthy in any way. So now you have mil millions of users with multiple devices all pushing stuff at high volume. Well, you have to do stuff like replicate data to separate databases. This is where the timestamp thing becomes a serious issue. Even if you have one server you're using as the timestamp server, there's just no way to solve this. You can't do it. So some of the possible solutions of solving this sync are there are all sorts of well-known things. Even back from like the 80s and the 70s, Leslie Lamport wrote a whole bunch of great papers on this. Uh, Google has to. You can, you can look at the implementation of REAC. Um, I spent my time in the 90s doing a lot of stuff with LDAP, and LDAP has a really good replication solution. So we looked at all these different ideas. We looked at op operational transformation from the Google Wave project. Um, but we wanted to keep things simple, and we are developers. And the main thing we were dealing with is how we keep data in sync and how we know which version is the latest and how we know that our local changes won't overwrite things on the server. And as we're work working every day, there's a system that we use that helps us understand, uh, or that already does this for us, right? Git. So what we have built is something based on the idea of Git. And I actually have the plan at some point in the future to build an actual Git-based backend to Wonderlist because it is the same thing. So you have in Git, the important thing that you have to know is that you have revisions, uh, and the revisions are in a tree. So every change branches off of another change, and if you try to push a change to another repository, which usually is a server but doesn't have to be because it's multi-master and peer-to-peer, and -peer, if you don't have the local change, it's rejected and you have to pull what's there and then merge locally. So that's the approach that we took, and it actually works really, really well. Now we did it in a, we, we did it in a way that required us to uh, create those version numbers in a, like across multiple different servers. So we're using atomic updates in SQL. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. The second problem is scale. Wonderlist 2, polling. We had millions of hungry clients just polling via REST. This kind of sounds like a good idea, but obviously it doesn't work. It's very expensive. We kept going down, et cetera. So we looked at our existing infrastructure, and we had four problems. We had a monolithic application, a monolithic database. Most of us have had that in the past. It's an anti-pattern. We all grow into it for some reason. We implemented caching because things were slow. Guess what? Everything got slower, but also buggy. Um, we did our own auto-sharding solution because we were smart. But auto-sharding is a really bad idea, just like automated failover and multi-master replication usually is. And basically, everything we tried to do that was smart was wrong and, and actually made us slower and less available. So our mantra now is keep things simple, and not just simple, but stupid. We like to use the word stupid or the word dumb to describe the things we do, and we celebrate that. Just make your client dumb, make your server dumb, make every piece of code dumb that you can, and then take that dumb thing that every single human being on the team could understand and optimize it when it's slow, only when it's slow. Solve only simple problems, because we're building just a to-do list. Come on, it's got to be simple, right? So if you find yourself solving a difficult problem, make it a simple problem. Defer the hard part till the next step. It's just like TDD. I don't know if you've experienced this yourselves, but when you do TDD right, every single step is easy, and you just keep pushing the complexity away. Finally, you get to the end, there's nothing left. So that's the way we've, we've solved this uh, performance issue with Wonderlist. Small is simple. So another mantra is everything must be small. Tiny applications, tiny services, microservices, tiny data where possible, the microservices wrap the data, uh, and then tiny traffic where we can get it. So one step to doing this tiny traffic thing, the light went off, what does it mean? Three minutes, okay, it's not flashing at me though, uh, is to keep all of our changes small. So we did two things. One is we implemented a push model for all of our data. 
And the other is we actually visualized our data as a tree. And it's kind of like the way Russian doll caching works, if you've heard of that. But if you think of the data as a tree, you have a root, you have a user, a user has lists, the lists have tasks, the tasks have subtasks, etc. If a subtask changes, it can notify its parent task, which can notify its parent list, which can notify its user, etc. So whenever you need to see, do I have anything new, all you have to do is say, has anything changed in the universe? And for that, we hit this thing called root, which is a tiny, tiny, because tiny is good, Haskell application, which outperforms anything else that we have. And most of the time, the answer is no, because people are mostly reading and not writing. The next step and the final step to making our, our scale small is real-time push. And so this is what our architecture looks like, and I won't go into too much detail, but now all of the clients connect to these lightweight WebSocket servers, and then they just sit there. So most of the time they don't have to do anything. They only do something when they're pushed a message. And we have now comprised our architecture over a bunch of tiny little services. Everything is asynchronous in the background, pushing stuff to clients when they need them. Um, and as you can see, they're written in many, many languages. We no longer have a monolith. We've broken our databases up into a bunch of tiny ones. Instead of doing crazy auto sharding, we just do it vertically. Final slide, uh, we chose the play frame framework for that front end thing. It's written in Scala. And uh, the reason is if you look at the WebSocket framework for play, everything is, is uh, non-blocking and asynchronous by default. And this is literally all you have to type to set up a highly available actor-based uh, WebSocket solution in play. It's really nice. I think I am out of time. I will gladly talk and answer questions on a break. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank <laughs> you.